Carnegie Mellon University's advanced database systems course is filmed in front of a live studio audience. Um, we're all going to die. Okay. But in the meantime, let's do databases. All right, so today's class, we're going to talk about networking protocols, and then this will be the, we're sort of hitting the, what we call the second third, we're finishing up sort of the second third of the semester of the, of the materials, so this week, and then for the next two weeks, we'll talk about query optimization, and then after that, we'll go through and start reading the papers for, you know, major systems and understanding, you know, how they work, and putting the things we talked about this semester, start seeing how they're going to be applied by the companies and, and the people building these various systems, okay? So last class was all about how to take user-defined functions that some, the application developer has written because uh, they want to embed logic that would normally be in the application. They want to embed that directly inside of the database system and evoke it through a query. And the idea was through uh, inlining techniques, we can convert the UDF constructs into uh, to SQL relation algebra and then have that be exposed to the query optimizer to figure out what the intention, what the, what the, what the user-defined func user function actually wanted to do. All right, so this is an example, again, of pushing the application logic into the database system. So as I said at the end of last class, today's lecture is about uh, how to sort of do the opposite of get data out of the database system and bring it over to the application so the application could, could, you know, can process it and do, do what it wants. So we'll first talk about, you know, start off with talking about like what these di different database access APIs look like. Uh, then we'll go into more details of what the net network protocols look like. And that was the paper you guys were assigned to read about just actually, what do the bits look like, and how it's ineff inefficient for uh, in modern application scenarios where data scientists may be working in pandas or some Python notebook, um, and want to just want to do a select star and get a bunch of data out, and then do all the processing on, on the client side. So we'll see how the uh, sort of the major database systems today, the existing protocols, are are insufficient or, or just not designed for that that kind of workload. And the answer is going to be in the end. It's going to be Apache Arrow is, is the solution, right? So the, the paper you guys read is a, came out before uh, the Arrow database connectivity library stuff was defined, but they basically are reinventing the same thing, and, and then ADBC and Arrow will do the same thing. But we'll, 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 we'll build up to that. Then we'll talk about additional optimizations we can do on the server side to make things run faster uh, at the networking stack or potentially for other parts of the system by either doing kernel bypass or user space bypass. And then we'll finish up quickly just talk about Okay, what are some additional optimizations we could do on the client side if we know our Python program or whatever it is is talking to a database system and it's going to put some data into a, a data frame, right? So I would say uh, some of the things we'll talk about today will be applicable for backend communication between the various databases, like the, the workers in, in, in your system. Like, uh, you know, if, if it's, a, it's a parallel system and one, one worker needs to communicate with another worker or needs to communicate with the optimizer service or the scheduler service, Right? A lot of these things that we'll talk about in that, in that environment will still matter. Certainly kernel bypass stuff could, could, could help, um, or user bypass stuff can help. But like the, you know, this is really, we're going to mostly focus on like how do we actually expose data to, to the client and how to make that run efficiently. But we'll see when we go through the discussions of the, the real world systems uh, where some, some, there are some optimizations we can apply in, in the back end. All right. So, Last class, I showed a really quick demo of opening up the Postgres terminal and you know writing a SQL query and hitting enter and then getting back some results, right? That's so that's sort of like the you know, a basic ape access method to the database system where you're you know sending a SQL query and you're getting back results that are meant to be printed out on the screen, right? Because it's meant to be interpretable by humans, but most you know most queries aren't going to run like that. Uh, most queries are going to want data in a typically a binary form because it can be fed into some kind of application code that wants to do some additional processing on it, right? So like in my example of the terminal, that's just plain text. And actually in that case of Postgres, Postgres is actually sending, going to send plain text data over the wire back to, to, the, to the client. We'll see one system in particular that actually does that no matter whether it's talking to an application or a terminal. Uh, but most systems are going to be doing binary uh, data serialization. So you wouldn't actually want to write your application by just like piping out to, to, to psql or whatever the, the command line terminal you want to use. Instead, you're going to write your application using one of these different methods. Um, and these aren't, uh, these aren't mutually exclusive, 
like you could at you know depending if your application maybe is written in C sharp or C++, you would use this. If it's Python, you use that and so forth, right? So various systems are going to support some of these, but we'll see when we when we go through it that like the thing that we're really going to care about is this like the low level network API uh, of what the hell again how we're going to put bits on the wire, and then all of these methods except for maybe the last one uh, can can hide all that, right? So the first one is like this is this is sort of uh, this is a proprietary API that the system exposes to you, typically through like a C library. Um, and it's like, you wouldn't want to write this for your application. This is like if you're writing a driver for these other ones here. You, you would use kind of these kind of things. And you can look at the documentation for like MySQL and Postgres, right? They all have uh, information about the, the, the API for like in the low level C library. Like how do you open up a connection? How do you send a query? How do you do authentication and so forth, right? And you can use ChatGPT to, to write this kind of stuff, right? You can basically say, you know, you know write, me, write me a C, or C, C, uh, C program that uses uh, lib, lib, libpq, which is the, the low-level C API interface that uh, you would use to, to program in, in Postgres. But again, like, you, you typically you don't write programs like this. You, you'll use some other abstraction. You, you can even use a higher-level abstraction, like an ORM, like if you're writing Django, Active Record, Ruby and Rails. SQLize and Node.js, right? Underneath the covers, they may be calling the C API, but you as the application programmer aren't writing code against these things. So say I want to focus now on, on these two. Um, the Python one came, came later in the 90s, but you'll sort of see how things get built up over time. And a lot of things we'll talk about for you guys in JDBC is applicable for you know, whatever, the, you know, pick your favorite library. So I pick your favorite programming language that has a specification for how to do database connectivity and they would basically follow through the same thing. Because the big idea of what these APIs are going to do for us is that, in theory, instead of programming against the low-level like C API, like these things, instead we could program against these uh, technically database system agnostic uh, APIs. And then if we decided you know, change what database server or database system we want to use, we wouldn't have to change our, in, in any of our application code. Of course, that's not entirely true if you're writing raw SQL, because as we said many times, the SQL dialect could be different from one system to the next, but we can ignore that. So the history for this goes back into the, the late 80s, uh, early 90s. Basically, prior to something like ODBC, it was just these C, C libraries that all the various database system vendors provided. So things weren't portable. You were writing, again, to, to a low-level API to talk to the database system that was very specific to the one database system you, 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 know, you were using. Um, and so there was early, people identified early on that it'd be nice to have people writing a lot of applications. It'd be nice to have a standard way to, to do database connect, connectivity and to you know, send queries, get back results. So I think the first attempt was in the late 80s from Sybase. They had something generically called DB library. That was meant to be like an open source standard. I don't know if it was actually open source. It was meant to be the standard everyone can implement. Um, but that didn't go anywhere. And then Microsoft teamed up with this other company called Sima Technologies uh, in the early 1990s, and they put forth this thing called ODBC. Um, and so now pretty much every database system that you can think of today is going to have an ODBC uh, implementation, even if it's actually not a relational database system uh, and doesn't support SQL. Like MongoDB has an ODBC uh, implementation, right? Because again, at some point you have to put it in the query command that you want to send over, and ODBC doesn't know, doesn't care that whether it's SQL or not. Just here's the thing I need to send to the server. But there's other APIs that are like, you know, iterate a result sets, bind parameters to values and so forth, or values to parameters and so forth. So at a high level, it looks like this. So the ODBC is going to be based on the device driver model. It's sort of similar how like the hardware works in PCs, where you know, if you buy like a graphics card, the, the vendor that sells you the graphic card, they're also going to provide you with the, a driver that you can install in your OS to be able to communicate with the hardware. So the same idea, the database system vendor is going to be responsible for providing you with a driver that you can use uh, based on the ODBC spec and then communicate with the, the database server. So the, if the application wants, wants to run, you know, run some, some queries on the database, they go through the ODBC driver. Uh, and then the ODBC driver is responsible for sending the request over to the database server, getting back the result, and then marshalling it back into the form that's required by the ODBC spec, then expose it to your application. So this can mean things like if my client is expecting everything to be 32-bit integers, but the database server sends me back 64-bit integers, then the driver is responsible for converting that and cleaning things up. 
It also can do other things, like there's certain features that, that are in the ODBC spec that the database system doesn't support. Cursors, for example, like Postgres doesn't support cursors, like true cursors. Um, then you, the driver can emulate that, basically. Like, send the query over, give you back a cursor to it, and then you're just iterating over the results that are cached on, on the client side. Right? So you can do a bunch of stuff in the, in the driver. So the thing that we care about today is, is this piece here. Right? The request going out and the response coming back. They were going to call this the, the wire protocol, the network protocol of the database system. So this is what we're, we're, we're going to focus on. Yes? Do commands received uh, by ODBC, for example, do, like, where do they get inserted into the, into the stream? Do they run through the query optimizer? Is it, does it just like, get converted to SQL and go through everything? Or? So the question is, like, like, if I have a SQL query, where does that get like, converted to a plan? Well, my understanding like, is, No, no, they, like, there'll be a, like, prepare statement command, and you put a string in, that'll be the, whatever the flavor of SQL the database system supports. And that won't be, that, that can't, there's no way that can be universal across other data systems. But, like, the API call to say, here's the query I want to run, and then you then execute it, get back a result. Now iterate over the result set, and give me the, the for each row, the second, give me the second attribute, and I want that as an integer, all that standardized. But the SQL itself just goes over the wire, and then all the, the parsing, the planning, the optimizing, all that happens over here. Okay, yeah. Again, this is basically going to be calling typically the, the C API that I, that I mentioned before. All right. So let's talk about, um, so again, this, this was the first one, the big one that really took off. And again, in the late, early to mid-90s, everybody was, was supporting ODBC at this point. Um, and then Java comes along mid '90s, uh, and then Sun recognized that, uh, you know, they, if you want to build Java applications in the enterprise, you need, they need to be able to talk about talk about database systems or talk to database systems. So they had to support, you know, something similar to ODBC, but for for Java, right? Um, and at the time, again, ODBC was was very much Windows specific, but since then, it's it's sort of generic and it's expanded. Um, but again, but but at the time, you know, it was it was. Is Windows specific and for uh, and for C++ applications, so it wouldn't work in in the Java world, right? In the same way that Rust is the hot thing now, Java was the hot thing in the in the, the mid '90s. Right? The idea was like you write your program once, and the JVM can then run it anywhere. Like that was mind blowing uh, for people back then. Go was the hot thing ten years ago. There's always some kind of fad. All right, so JDBC comes along, uh, and the you can sort of think of this as like, again, it's basically the same thing as ODBC, just now it's for Java instead of C. But because they were trying to bootstrap this, uh, this, this new connectivity API to an existing ecosystem of a bunch of database systems that already support ODBC, uh, and they want to be able to people get up and running uh, for any possible data system as soon as possible, um, they have a different variations of how you can build it a native, or how to build a, a JDBC library or API or in implementation of it. Um, and they have various methods to like sort of bridge the gap between what was available at the time versus what came on later. So the, the four approaches are, the first one is that there is no native JDBC implementation, Java implementation of, of communicating with the data system. So instead what you provide is a, uh, basically a, a, a bridge or a wrapper in Java that then invokes ODBC, like the actual shared objects, the, the C code, that then that communicates with the, the database system. Right? So this was meant to be like, Again, if, you're, if, if, you, if you have a database system that doesn't support JDBC uh, yet, you could just wrap something around uh, ODBC and use that. The next approach was that you would use, uh, have JDBC calls make JNI uh, invocations down into the C code uh, of, 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 of the, the C API and have that go over the wire talk to the database system. Right? And again, this is because think of like taking the bytes, putting into buffers, all that was done in C, and then the thing was just copying the data up into Java. Another approach is basically you have a separate middleware, like a separate server running that the JDBC thing then would talk to, and then that middleware then would use ODBC to talk to your, your database system, right? So it's sort of ec extra hop to, to make the call you needed. Um, and the last one is, is obviously going to be more ideal, is that you have a pure Java implementation that, it, that calls, that makes the JDBC calls that you provide from the application directly into the JDBC, the, the, the vendor-specific wire protocol commands, right? So, Every single database system at this point is going to have their own native Java uh, JDBC implementations 
But again, think of how many times you come across something like in Rust or some cargo you want to use, and there isn't a native implementation. It's just calling in the C. That's really the top, the top thing up there. So the top one has been removed, and this is the one. This is the best one, and this can be the most common one, at least for the most the major database systems today. All right. So as I was saying, the thing we care about is what's being sent over the wire to communicate from the client, whether it's ODBC, JDBC, or whatever it is, uh, to the database server. Um, and so every database system, for the most part, is going to implement their own proprietary wire protocol, uh, typically over TCP IP. And it's going to use that to be, again, to, to, to send the bytes back and forth and, and acknowledgments and get, take queries in and get responses back. Um, if you're running on the same box and it's, and it's Linux, you can use Unix domain sockets to get, get faster performance because you're not going through the full TCP IP stack in the OS, both on the client side and, and the server side. Um, you can do this in Postgres. Uh, but again, if you're running in the cloud, the DB server is like some faraway location. You're not going to be able to do this. Most systems do not, or actually, I'm not aware of any system that uses UDP to communicate between the client and the server. Right? TCP has its overhead because you have to send the acknowledgments and, and back and forth, right? Where UDP, you sort of you know, throw it over and hope it makes it. Uh, so no system I'm aware of will do this on the, from between the client and the server. We'll see uh, one system later on, Yellowbrick, They'll actually do this between the communicate, use UDP to communicate between the backend servers because it's just so much faster. And they basically have to do their own you know, retry and, and acknowledgments on their own. But in that case, because they're trying to get the best performance possible, it was worth it for them to implement this. Postgres uses UDP to communicate between the stats collector and the different workers. But again, that's all in the backend on, on the same box. It's again not between the client and the server. So typically, what, what happens is the way uh, you would communicate with the database server is that the client comes along, connects to the database system. There's, you, there's always going to be some kind of authentic, authentication process, right? Or you know, either you're given a token that you because you've you've authenticated with something else, or you do a username, password, or what, whatever the mechanism is. Um, ideally, you want this to be using SSL or TLS, um, but you know, because you know you don't, you don't want people to sniff your packets. Then you send over the query. The the database system will then block that connection. Uh, well, it's not true because you can do asynchronous stuff, but like it'll run that query. And then as soon as it starts getting results, uh, it serializes them and sends them back o over the wire. Now, some systems can do cursors, for example, and start spooling you some of the results, even though the query starts running. The query is still running. Um, but as far as I know, most of the cloud systems, it's like, all, like once you get all the results, then you can start send sending things back. Right? Obviously, it depends on the query, too. Like if the last, if the root node in the, in the query plan is like an order by with, with a limit on it, you need to see all the data before you need to start, start sending anything up. So again, the thing we care about this today is, is this, this sort of step here. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit at the end of like what we can do to maybe speed that, that piece up faster. So I would say also, too, the, in the paper you guys read, the, they talk about how this part is actually not that big of a deal. Right? We spent the whole semester so far how to talk about how to build a fast database system, how to run queries really fast. Uh, and you know, there's obviously, if you're reading petabytes of data, sure, that's going to take a long time. But the, in the paper you guys read, and, and then this other work that came out from, uh, from, on this thing called Connector X, this thing is actually the most expensive part, just, just sending that over the network and back to, to, the, to the client. Right? Again, the query themselves aren't going to be that big. Like The biggest SQL query that you can get at, at top is going to be like 10 megabytes. We have like the SQL string. So that's not expensive to send. Uh, it's sending the results back is, is, is going to be because it'll be various steps along the way because you may have to copy it in the form that the, that the client or network protocol wants, and that may, may not be the same as you're natively storing in the database. Yes? How would a SQL query reach 10 megabytes? The question is, how would a SQL query reach 10 megabytes? Yeah, so this example actually comes from Google. They told me that they had, uh, it's not hard to imagine either, right? They had some dashboard where you can click a bunch of checkboxes of what you want to you know, visualize, okay. right? And all that's doing is just concatenating. You know, search options in a giant in clause, and then before you know it, you got a 10 megabyte SQL string. It's rare. I'm not saying it's it's common, but uh, you can imagine something something like that. Yeah, we didn't really talk about tricks of how to make ins go faster. Um, you basically, in that case, if if your in clause is huge, you basically build a hash table on the on like on the expression itself. Then you use that to probe when when you do lookups. It's like a join. It's like you think of like the enclosed as like a, almost like materializing another temp table. If it's huge, if it's big. Other questions? 
OK. So if you're going to build a new database system today, uh, you have two choices. You either can implement your own wire protocol by, by scratch, uh, and then, then in which case, then you have to, you have to write you know, your JDBC, ODBC uh, client libraries, the drivers, to support talking to your database system. Um, the, the more common thing to do now, though, is just use an existing wire protocol from an existing database system, because then you can just inherit their driver ecosystem for free. Right? It's not enough just to say, like, OK, I, I speak the wire protocol, um, to say you're compatible with, with another database system. Like if you, that would be, that's the bare minimum. If you just spoke the wire protocol, the, the client drivers don't know, or typically don't know, don't care what the SQL query looks like, sort of related to his question. Like they're not parsing on the client side to see, are you really sending me a Postgres, you know, like a Postgres uh, compatible query? They're just sort of sending the, the text over. Um, so if you want to be able to support more of the, the ecosystem, then you have to support the catalogs and other functionality. But the bare minimum you would need is just to say, I need the wire protocol. So it's about 50-50 now. Uh, it didn't, be, didn't used to be this way. But the, the two most common wire protocols that are going to be reused is going to be MySQL and Postgres. MySQL used to be number one. Postgres is actually uh, becoming more and more, more, more popular. And that's partly because there's a, lot of, well, there's a lot of databases that are like forks of Postgres, where they keep the, sort of the top half, including the network layer. Uh, so you're speaking the wire protocol, and then they rewrite the, the bottom layer. Right? That's, that's what Neon does, and Redshift, and others do. Um, the third most common wire protocol is actually Redis. Uh, and this is because it's so simple. It's like text-based, like get and sets and simple things like that. Um, but again, if you support these existing protocols, someone can, can you know, run against your new database system you, without having to rewrite their application or change what driver they're using, because you, you, know, you just piggyback up off of the, the existing driver implementations. Snowflake, interestingly, did not do this. Uh, I think it's a different time. Snowflake decided, oh, we're going to write our own wire protocol from scratch, uh, including their own SQL dialect from scratch. Uh, I, they started in what, 2011, 2012. I think if you're going to build a new system today, it would be, it'd be, it'd be a hard decision to do that, because right? there's just so much stuff you can reuse if, you're, you, know, if you speak the, the, the Postgres wire protocol. All right, so the, again, so the paper I had you guys reading, uh, re read was about how to get you know, uh, how to improve the, the wire protocol between these different database systems. Um, and they sort of focus on, on four key design decisions. I would say also the background of this paper is that this is from the MonetDB Lite project, which was a precursor to DuckDB. So Hannes and Mark, who are the authors of this paper, they, as part of the, the work they were doing when trying to make MonetDB be embeddable, they realized all the problems they were having of getting data in and out uh, to, you know, into like pandas and, and R programs. Um, even if you're still running on the, on the same, in the same process. So this is sort of what led them to, to, to throw away the code and, and start building DuckDB. So this, again, it's the same team, but this before DuckDB became a thing. And again, this, this paper is focused on doing large data exports. So it's not complex queries of doing you know, a bunch of joins and a bunch of sophisticated aggregations. It's more or less like select star queries, or even getting a subset of the columns projected out to then be able to feed that into uh, a Pandas or Python program to do additional computation or train machine learning models and so forth, right? So this, is, this, this paper is really about how to get data out, out of the server in, into the client. So now whatever, again, whatever optimizations we're going to have talking about today, you're going to have to also implement them in the client driver. Because if you start compressing things on the, on the server side, send that over the wire, if the client doesn't know how to decompress them, then like, the data is useless. Or likewise, if I convert from the, a row-oriented format to a, a columnar format, if the, if the client doesn't know how, to, how to, that you did that tra uh, transpose, then it's, 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 all, it's all useless, right? And so typically, client drivers are being very conservative, and they're not going to want to have a lot of, uh, of, of extended capabilities in them because now you have to support that for every single possible language you ever want to support. So if you... If you have like the C API and you just wrap that around the various different uh, programming languages, then that's fine because you just sort of implement it once. But as I was saying before, ideally you want to have a native uh, implementation of your client driver in whatever programming language you're running in, so you don't have this copying over between like C or to whatever programming language you want, right? And so if now you have all these additional features in your client driver, 
Well, now everybody who, every programming language that implements your client driver has to implement the same thing. And that becomes, sort of, could become problematic because it's fractured. People don't implement all the, all the same capabilities, right? So there's a trade-off between how sophisticated we can be versus what people are actually going to be able to do on the client drivers. Furthermore, in a modern scenario, uh, we haven't really talked about Lambda functions or serverless applications, but a very common scenario now is like the communication between the database server is like I, I spin up a Lambda function, which is like, say some Python thing that, that is run. It connects to the database server, does authentication, sends some queries, get back results, and then does some minor processing and then goes away. So in that case, you're paying for the compute time on, on the serverless function, and you don't want to have to do a bunch of expensive decentralization if you have a very sophisticated um, you know, uh, client protocol. And, the, and again, the answer is going to be Apache Arrow is going to be the right solution to this. That's, that's sort of a spoiler. All right, so we're going to go through, through these through the four major pieces one by one and see what the trade-offs are, again, not just for performance, but also, again, from the engineering side of, of, on, on the client. So the first one is going to be kind of obvious, right? Because we, this is why we started off in the semester, row store versus a column store. And ODBC and JDBC are, by the, you know, by their nature, are row-oriented APIs because they were developed in the 1990s, early 1990s, before columnar databases were a thing. Right? The, the paper in columnar databases, the first one in col column stores is like 82, 83, but that's a th theory paper. Uh, there was a Swedish system that was a, technically a column store, but like in the 70s, when no one's ever heard of that. Sybase IQ is probably the first one that came along with it. was a true column store implementation, but that's like 97, 98. So again, ODBC comes along in 1990, their column stores aren't a thing. And most of the applications people are writing are like business applications that are like going fetching you know one order record or you know a, a, a sing, single entities single information, right? So th it was inherently row oriented. So in this world, what's going to happen is the server is going to take all the tuples that it's getting part of its output, uh, and even though the on the server side it may be storing them as a column store, it's going to stitch them back together, materialize them back together because because the, the client protocol, the wire protocol, wants it in a, in a row oriented manner. Because then you write applications and sort of pseudo JDBC, stuff like this. We're going to iterate over the result set and get one tuple at a time and extract out the, the data you want row by row. But if we, uh, if we switch to a column in a format, then this deck could be, could be bad too because the, if I ever need to get multiple data for, uh, uh, for a single, single tuple across multiple columns, then I have to write some weird code of like, Iterate over the columns and iterate over the next rows and try to put, you know, stitch things back together. Again, this is not real code. This is some pseudocode here, right? So the solution is basically the same thing we talked at the very beginning. We want a pack space model because now we can operate over batches of, of tuples. Uh, and although we're going to be sending them the data out in a, in a you know, columnar fashion, they'll, we'll group them together in row groups or small enough chunks where all the data we would need for a single tuple will be, will, will be close together, right? So this is what Arrow does, uh, as we talked about. And so Arrow uh, has this thing called the Arrow Database Connectivity, and it's basically like JDBC or ODBC. It's a specification, a programming API for, to, to how to interact with a database system and operate over uh, getting, back, getting back vectors. And so if now your database system supports ADBC, which some systems do, like Snowflake, for example, then now I can make requests, send a SQL query over to the database system and, and get it back in native arrow form, and then I can integrate that and use that in my, my application any, any way that I want with one, without having to do any copying or deserialization because it's already in the, you know, the, a, a, a vector format. So we're not going to go through like what ADBC like ADBC is like it's, again not everyone actually supports it but this is going to be this is basically what Hannes and Mark are going to propose like hey it'd be nice we have this vector based API and this is what this is what came out later right because the paper you guys read predates predates ADBC okay so now if we want to begin assuming we're sending, sending things back as vectors how we want to support compression. And this basically is going to smell like, again, all the stuff we talked about before in storage of this trade-off between having general purpose or naive compression of just taking blocks of data and throwing gzip or snappy at it uh, versus having a more lightweight encoding scheme that's specific to the actual data that I'm storing. 
So again, the easiest approach is to do just gzip or snappy or z standard. Um, and this is basically you do all the same wire protocol uh, construction of the, of the packets of messages that you would normally do, but right before you send it over the wire, you just run you know, gzip or snap you want it to compress it before it sends it over. And the client basically does the reverse of it. So this is not that common. Uh, it's not owned by default for most systems, but I know for like Oracle and actually Snowflake it might be owned by default, um, but like a, like a real low light compression. But Oracle, MySQL, and BigQuery, these are things you can go add on a after the fact. Um, BigQuery is doing this over HTTP, so I think it's just part of the, the HTTP uh, client protocol. They're adding, they're adding gzip, right? Uh, Oracle added this in, I think, 2013. Um, MySQL's had it, I think, for a while. Um, there was a patch to do this and add this in Postgres in 2018, but that, that, that didn't go anywhere. So Postgres doesn't support this. All right, and then the, um, the, the next approach is, again, it's doing all the stuff we talked about before, using dictionary encoding, RLE, depth encoding, uh, uh, frame of reference encoding. Um, and again, the idea is that like you, you you recognize the, the data type of the, of the data you're sending back over the, over the, for the response, and you just run this, this compression scheme, whatever you want on it. So nobody does this because, again, it would be, except for Arrow, because you can, if it's, Arrow does dictionary coding, like that's the only encoding scheme that I think it supports out of the box. So like if you get, if you, if you get data back as Arrow, it would be already dictionary encoded. But they're not doing you know, the delta encoding RLE stuff as well. Again, nobody does this because, as I was saying before, you'd have to have all your client drivers also support this as well. Uh, and typically, the way it works is like when your client connects to the database server, it's like when you do like an uh, SSH handshake. You say, "Here's what I, here's the features I can support," and the client and the server then pick the sort of the bare minimum they would have. So you could have like a bunch of old, you know, you have a bunch of clients showing up with old driver implementations and then not support any any of these things. Um, so. I think it's part of the reason that no, nobody does this. And again, from the engineering side, you have to support, support this all the different uh, implementations. Um, yes? Is it really uh, either or? Can't you have both ways? Like, from what I read in the paper, I thought you have columns specific encoding and then you do GZIP on top. Yes, yeah, so same as, like, it, it's not exclusive. Like, you, you could do both, yes. Uh, and then furthermore, depending on what, how you, like, in, serialize the data, like if you're just doing text encoding and you pad things out, then this one's gonna be make a big, big, big difference versus like this, right? Yes, so they're not mutually exclusive. But I'm saying nobody would, as far as I know, other than error ADBC, nobody does this because I was saying the drivers have to support it. Um, so basically everything I'm saying here is all the things we talked about earlier when we talked about getting things from the object store or from disk. Um, when the communication channel between the storage or the, the, between the client and the server is slow, then heavyweight compression is gonna be much better because we're willing to pay that trade-off of spending more CPU cycles to compress the data down to smaller, smaller sizes because then that'll speed things up as, as, as we send it over, right? Um, and obviously, the larger the, the chunks of data we're sending over, the better compression ratio we'll get. Next is how do we wanna send, uh, how do we wanna sort of serialize and encode the data we're sending over? Um, so the first approach is the most common one where you do binary encoding. Um, and this is where the, you're basically st sending the data from the client to the server in the same low-level binary form that it's being represented in, the, uh, in your database, at least ideally, not always the case though. Um, and in this case here, the client is responsible for dealing with any Indian issues. Like if the data is being stored in little Indian and your client for some reason is running on a big Indian machine, then the client is responsible for doing that conversion. Because the idea there is the, the database server is just trying to get you data as fast as possible. And the client can then, since, since there, there's more clients than servers typically, you, you can spread out the computational cost of doing that conversion uh, across all the different clients. So another question is going to be, OK, if we're going to want to use the binary encoding, how are we going to decide how, what, you know, what serialization scheme we're going to use? And in the paper you guys read, they argue that rolling your own uh, serialization format is better using than using existing libraries because these existing libraries bring up a bunch of other infrastructure, other things that you may not actually care about that add additional computational overhead and, and storage overhead or, uh, or space overhead for the, the packets they're sending back. So what, what do I mean by this? So like you can write your own uh, serialization format to like how to, how to take you know, result set of, of, of three attributes 
an integer floats and whatever, and pack them down into the byte representation that you then send over the wire. Or alternatively, you use one of these libraries like Proto Buffers, Thrift, or Flat Buffers is the newer one, the better one. Um, there's Cat and Proto, there's a bunch of these other ones. That basically, they provide you the, the capabilities to, 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 to define what the schema of the messages you're sending and, and serialize it out. So one year, somebody asked me, like, why doesn't any, if, if we're going to be sending back data through protobufs, why not just store protobufs natively? And I was like, nobody does that. That sounds, that sounds like a bad idea. Um, turns out somebody does do it, because uh, they emailed me later on. There is a system, I think it's like a toy project called ProfaneDB, where they'll, the wire protocol sends out protocol buffers, and the internally storage, they're storing everything as protocol buffers as well, because it's just bytes, right? So in that case, you don't do any deserialization or reserialization when someone requests something, because you just send over the stuff you've already stored as, as protobufs. I, it's not, I'm not saying it's a good idea, but it, it does exist. Um, the other challenge also, too, is like with protobufs, it, that's least, that one is least separated enough from gRPC, where like you don't have to bring in all the infrastructure for gRPC. In Thrift, as far as I remember, like you, you bring in their like threading models, the thread pools, and I think buffer pools as well. Like this brings up way more infrastructure uh, if, you, if you choose to use this. Flat buffers is, is, is is uh, it's like protobufs. It's it's, it's, uh, it's pretty simplistic and, does, and it's just the serialization format. There's other things that these guys provide you as well, which may or may not be useful because they they can find like keep track of the versioning of your 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 messages and so forth. So like over time, if you're if you're if you expand the capabilities or the 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 internal data members of the packets of messages you're sending when you send back results to take queries in. Uh, Protobuf will keep track of like the different versions of it, so you know what version of the API uh, you're inter interacting with. All right, the other approach is to do text encoding, and this is like the simplest thing to do. Is this you take no matter what the data is, and you run the equivalent of like two string or str on it to convert it from the binary form to a string form, and then you just send it over as variable length strings to the to the client, right? And this one is nice because you don't have to worry about endianess because it's it, you know, some ASCII or UTF-8 format. The client then takes your, your text and converts it back to the binary format, uh, and then can put it in whatever in form that it wants. Right? For missing values, you could have a separate bitmap to keep track of what values are null. Uh, in MoonDB, they just store the value null, or the, literally the string null to represent you have a null string. Right? Yes? You mean I to A to all the A to A, right? Uh, yeah, so yes. Well, you need I to, I to A to, 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 to make it an ASCII and then reverse it with A to I. Yes. So is this a good idea or a bad idea? Yes. What happens if you have a string in your database that is null? What if it's the word null in your database? As he points out, what if, what if the string literally is just null? What do you do? I don't know. This is a moon to be. I forget what they did. <laughs> So a good, other than his, like, like if, how do you store null? Uh, is this a good idea or a bad idea? Why? He says bad idea, why? What is his hand gesture? Well, it explodes the size of their data, right? Explodes the size of the data, uh-huh. Uh-huh. Why do we need texting? Why do this? So like encoding is like this. If I have a four byte, thirty bit integer, one, two, three, four, five, six, when I send it over the wire to the client, I'm literally gonna convert it into the string, the ASCII string, character one, character two, character three, character four, five, six. And then I'll I'll do what you said. I, I'll I'll either I'll store the length of the string in front of it, or I could do I could do null termination. But like every piece of data that I'm sending over in in a, in a record is gonna be a string form of it. But in binary what is the difference? Yeah. Well, again, so like I can store. No, no, no. So like, like this is storing like this is a. If you look at the bits, this will be thirty-two bits to store this number. Oh, that number. Okay. Yes. Oh. This is going to be each of these is going to be say one byte to store oh, okay. the store the, the character one, the ASCII character one. Oh, okay. Right. And you have to store the size. As well. And you have to store the size or the or, or the null terminator, or keep it fixed length, which is the the, the, the next one. So good idea or bad idea? Bad idea because more data and obviously the null terminator. If you use that, then what happens to you know it's Ben's point, right? What happens to you? It, it also seems instead of compression, they've gone the, the wrong direction. Yeah. 
Yeah, so he's going, he's, instead of going, instead of compressing this, you're going in the wrong direction. But then, if you do, if you put gzip on top of this, it's going to compress the hell out of it and do fantastic. Potentially, yes. Maybe you spit on that one. <laughs> I need a slower computation to do it. Yes. Why would GZIP work better on approach two than it would work on approach one? Because there's gonna be there's gonna be more things to compress. Because there's, there's, there's more bits. That's like that's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll we'll look at the results in a sec. Give it a sec. What's that, say again? Like, so if you run zip on the four bytes trend, four byte thing versus you run it on six, like the end result, which one will be smaller? It's quite, the statement is, is like, if you compress the, 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 the 30 bits are this versus whatever the six bytes plus the, 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 the null terminator or the, or the length, like is that thing ever going to be smaller than this? No. You, you might be able to do a dictionary starting. Yes. The statement is, uh, the data system would know better whether to see how to serialize this, rather than just always, always doing the same thing. In theory, yes. But do you want to sp spend the time on the server side to do that, figure that out? All right, we'll come back to this. Um, so if you roll your own, so most systems are, most systems are going to do, do binary coding, but roll their own and not use one of the existing libraries. But then it's all the stuff we talked about before when, when we talked about you know, data file formats. We have, to do, we have to do the, the null mask, keep track of data types, keep track of the sizes of the data and the messages, right? That's fine. You know, we, we know how to write that stuff because we had to do it for storage anyway. Right? It's, just, it's just more work, whereas like protobuf gives you a bunch of stuff for free. But you, 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 it's all things in CS, you pay a cost. All right, this one we've already talked about. How are you going to represent actually the, the length of strings? Uh, you could do the, the, the C style, have the null terminator byte at the end. Um, and then can the client can just scan along until it finds the, the null term there and says, okay, now I have all the data that I need. Um, this makes it harder then to potentially do jumps into fixed length offsets. Uh, as we talked about before, if, you, if you're trying to do store things as, as, as sending things over as vector batches. The most common ones would be like length prefix, prefixes, which we, we, we've talked about before. And then some systems, I think this was, uh, I think MonoDB, they're just going to pad out the, the the, the string with additional characters uh, to, to be whatever the, the max size of the attribute could be. Like if I have a, if it's a bar chart 16, and I have a bunch of four character strings, I'm just going to pad out the rest with a bunch of spaces. Yes? Approach 3 is going to be the best one. Say it again? Approach 3 is going to be the best one. Right? His question is, same as it's approach 3 going to be the best? Yeah. Why? Because if it's fixed length, then if you are padding, you're padding only with zeros. So GSIP can take care of that. Yes. And if it's fixed width, you can jump around much faster if you want to. The statement is, if it's, if, it's, if it's fixed width and you're padding with a bunch of zeros, gzip can compress that. But then also, too, now everything will be fixed length, you can jump around as needed. And you don't need to decode, the, like, you don't need to first read the length, then these. Correct. You don't, so it, again, depends on, as all things do, it depends on what, what the query wants to do with it, right? And furthermore, also, too, if the column is like a var char 1024, and I have a bunch of one character strings in it, then that's wasting a ton of space. Why, what you're saying, why would people do that? Yeah. People are stupid. You see all sorts of crazy things in real databases, right? Yes? Would approach one, like, does it have any advantages? The question is, approach one have any advantages? On the storage side, sorry, on, on, the, on the server side, you can reuse like libc's string functions. Ah. <laughs> yeah. So when we, when we bought our first system, like my second or third year, or second year at CMU, we did this. And then, of course, then we go over the wire protocol because you're speaking of the Postgres wire protocol. Postgres, Postgres didn't want an alternator. We didn't have to copy the string and add, add the length in front of it. Uh, even if the, you have like one character in the back channel, uh, 1024, won't GZIP take care of that if you're padding everything? So, even, so statement is, even if you have the, the var chart 1024 and you, and you pad it out, even though you have these small strings, won't GZIP handle that for you? If you use GZIP, Okay. Yes. It takes time, but also if you use it, even Snappy or uh, Z standard would be fast. But like, 
you got like not all the, the data systems that support that. I just said Postgres doesn't support this. The Postgres wire protocol itself has no notion of compression. You can hack it by like tunneling all your traffic over SSH and compress that, but that's an extra hop and that sounds that sounds crazy. But like the, the Postgres wire protocol, as far as I know, at least in 2024, does not have like a flag and say this is going to be compressed. My my SQL has it, Oracle has it. Not not, not other systems don't, do not. So again, sometimes ones can be faster, sometimes uh, twos can be faster. Um, no system is going to do both. Uh, no system is going to try to figure out okay based on what your you know, what the data looks like and what your query looks like. I'm going to give you one versus the other because again that's more engineering overhead that you got to support now on the on the server side and on the client side, and it's just not worth it. Right? This will be the fastest if your data set size is small. If it's all char ones, this is going to be the fastest because you don't store the, the length. Okay, I'm going to show. Um, I would say also too, like as all things we talked about before, these aren't independent, right? Like if I if I choose one of these, that'll affect whether you know, how, how, you know what kind of compression scheme I want to use. Right? But that's very similar to the stuff we talked about when we talked about data on disk. So I'm going to show two graphs here. So the first is going to be what happens when we just send one tuple from, from the database system to the client. And the idea is here just to look at what the overheads of like just all the infrastructure around the, the messages of, of sending the query and get, getting, getting back the result. Um, so, and for all these systems except for Hive, these are all going to be using ODBC. Um, Hive is going to be using uh, JDBC. And I think, I forget the reason why they, they, they did that. Um, so here's the numbers, right? And they're, 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 they're listed in order of, of performance. Um, so the first thing to point out here is that here's, here's MonadDB that's using the text encoding thing that we talked about before. You know, they're sending over, converting all the, the, the binary data into string form and sending that over, right? All the other ones are using binary encoding. But yet MonadDB is, is the, what, the second fastest or third fastest, right? Why? Power of GZIP? It says power of GZIP. Uh, what's that? Yep. So is GZIP helping this helping him here? So all right, so let's talk about why the other ones are slow, right? So so, so the slowest one is Hive, right? Uh-huh. The reason why that's according to the paper, why that's slow is they're using Thrift. Uh, so Thrift is going to do, a, a, you know, copying things in and out of, of Thrift buffers, so that additional mem copies to get data, you know, on, onto Thrift on the server side, and then on the client side, copying out of their buffers as well. Um, and then Thrift is also going to be sending over a bunch of different uh, metadata about what the the structure of the of the um, what the structure of the message is going to be. Uh, you know, th- they're sending that that over as well. So the size of the, of the packet, the message, for to send the same tuple as all the other systems is just much, much higher. DB2 is the second slowest because they are actually, I mean, Oracle does this as well, but for some reason it's, it's more pernicious than this one. They are actually also basically re-implementing acknowledgments on top of TCP IP. So TCP IP is already going to be doing like, you know, sending acts back. They're going to be doing that as well above that to make sure that, like, okay, I got your message for this in the database server for this, you know, for, I got this packet. I'm ready. Give me the next one, right? So the, the the protocol itself is just way more chatty because, for some reason, they're they're implementing re-implementing this idea of you know of acknowledgments. Yes. Was it based on UDP earlier? Is that why they? His question is: Is it based on UDP? I I have no idea. This, also, too, like since it's a proprietary protocol, they can't see the implementation on the server side. This is what this is what in the paper they speculate. Yes. How is it possible for it to be so slow on Hive? Like for one tuple, like how, how many bits is that? Like at most, let's say. Oh, for, for TPCH, uh, it's, it's, it's less than less than less than a kilobyte. So less than a kilobyte. Like how could it take a whole second? I think also too for like, uh, this is like I think this is end to end time, right? And not like oh, okay. just sending the message. So like. This is like sending the query, and then Hive basically converts the query into a MapReduce job. Then it dispatches that, gets back the result, and sends it back. So I think it includes that. But I'd have to double check. 
And this one, the client, client's on the same machine as the server. Um, let's see, what else did I say? They, they minimize query execution time. They would query, the, query multiple times. So the database system would cache the query plan and the result. Ah, so I take, I take back what I said. It wasn't running the map produce job. It literally is just like how to get data in, in and out as fast as possible, right? Again, it's one second. It's long. Hive's not, Hive's not a great system. I'm not, I'm not yeah. It's not be, there's a reason why you're not, you know, Facebook ditched it and, and rewrote wrote Presto, right? Hive was a stopgap solution in the late 2000s when, and I was sort of part of this, like, the Hadoop came out, the MapReduce paper came out from Google. Yahoo took it, sort of re-implemented re the ideas as Hadoop. Hadoop was like the hot thing. Everyone was like, this is amazing. This is how you should be doing analytics and, and big data stuff. Um, the relational database people, which I was a part of, we were like, you guys are all doing it wrong. You're reinventing stuff that was invented in the 90s for, for parallel databases, distributed databases. And then like declarative languages like SQL is a good idea. Uh, you know, processing... Uh, you know, data on, on, on partition tables, that's a good idea. And then people realize, oh yeah, writing these map reduce jobs in Java sucks. It'd be nice if we had SQL. So then they built Hive, which is basically a translator from SQL, and it would then co-gen a map reduce Java program. So yeah, you're making a face. It's, 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 I'm, not, I'm not saying it's a good idea. Um, yeah, okay, for this game, they were surprised at how slow DB2 was. Again, as you were saying, it's, it's such a uh, small amount of data, but again, I think the protocol is just so chatty. Right? All right, so let's now look. We, we send more data. So for this one, we're going to send a million tuples from TPCH. Uh, and what they're going to do is they're going to scale along the, the x-axis. They're going to artificially slow down what the network latency is between the client and, and the server. Right? Um, and so the first line I want to show is just for MySQL with gzip and MySQL without gzip. So what, this basically corroborates what we talked about before with with storage, getting things again from S3 or the object store or whatever, when the network's really fast, you don't want to compress the data because the CPU cost of doing that, that additional compression is just not worth the penalty, or it's not worth it because the network is so fast. And so that's why you see this gap here. When the network's really fast, not using compression is, is the better way to go, even though you are sending more bytes. But then even though we are log scale here, but as we get to a slower speed, so 100 milliseconds for, for the latency, Again, we're log scale, but the, uh, the, the compression one actually is slightly better, right? Because in that case, the, the CPU or overhead is not the dominating factor of, of, of getting the data out. Right? It's basic, the, the basic compression overhead is bad when trade-off the network is fast, right? So now we bring back all the other ones, right? And they all basically converge or sort of moving along in the same way as expected, right? The... The, the time it takes to get the data out of the database server goes up as the network gets slower. But what's surprising here is that uh, you kind of see that case of Oracle, they're one of the faster ones when the network gets fast, but then as the network gets slower, they're now the, the second slowest, right? DB2 is always the slowest. Hive actually beats, yeah, Hive is actually beating DB2 on the slower network. Um, and so the, again, Oracle is, is a, Oracle is a proprietary uh, protocol. We can't see the implementation of it, but they speculate, spe they speculate again, just, just like in the case of DB2, uh, Oracle is also sending their own acknowledgments back and forth, and there's, it just becomes more uh, d dominating cost um, when the network gets slower. So again, all of these, except for high, sorry, except for MoneyDB, are, uh, are, uh, are binary protocols, but MoneyDB is actually, what, the... Uh, is the third best after MySQL and MySQL GZIP. Because it's simple, yes. Does the benefit from compression also apply to other systems? Other than MySQL? This question is, does, does, do you get the same benefit of compression uh, for the other systems as MySQL? I would assume yes. Like Oracle, you, you could test it. Uh, I would say yes, because the Oracle wire protocol, it's it's... The actual bits themselves may be different than what MySQL is, but it's a binary-based protocol, like MySQL. So it'd probably be about the same. Well, why do they only um, implement GZ on MySQL? Exception, why, why do they only turn on GZ for MySQL? I, I don't know. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to show another result from a different paper. This is a paper we wrote uh, with uh, my, one of my former, former master students, now a PhD student at MIT, 
and then Wes McKinney, the guy from Apache Arrow. So for this one, uh, this is from our, our older system, Peloton or Noise Page, and it was the idea was how fast can we get the, the line item table out of uh, the order line table out of TPCC. So like a, like a roughly a seven, seven gigabyte data, how can we fast can we get it to the to the client? So the client isn't doing any 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 computation on it. It's just how fast can, can you get it? And so the our system is supported the Postgres wire protocol. So this is like this is the default like Postgres wire protocol without compression, row based. This is how fast you can get the data out. So natively, our system was storing everything as as Apache Arrow tables. So that in our system, we could do transactions. Then over time, as the as the data you know you know got cold and you weren't modifying anymore, it would just then flip some bits around and then it would natively would be natively sorting Apache Arrow. So this next bar here is what you get from what they were proposing in the in the the, the paper you guys read of like here's the vectorized version of the of the, the Postgres wire protocol where you're sending things as, as a PAX format rather than uh, as row oriented. But then the next approach is using uh, the early precursor to ADBC, the arrow uh, connectivity stuff, where this is like natively sending out a, the Apache arrow uh, data in its form without doing any translation, just natively shoving that to uh, the Python application. And so it's faster because there's no conversion over the to convert it into a different form, right? It's exactly for what the, you know, we're sending the data we're storing natively in memory, we're just storing that, shoving that, those bytes right out. And so now the last one is RDMA. I'll cover what that is in a second. Basically, this is like a network accelerator to do kernel bypass, to, to literally get the data out of memory, put it on the NIC, and send it out without having to copy things into the CPU first. Um, and I forget we used, I think we used a fan band for this one. Um, but again, this one also is just sending out native arrow, arrow blocks rather than doing the conversion. So again, even though the paper you guys read didn't, didn't implement, you know, didn't have you know, arrow at the time to send, send data out, the, the performance difference, would, I think, would look like this. So again, what I'm saying. Something like ADBC, just shoving data out as arrow is, is the right way to go if you're building a modern system today. Yes? Uh, its question is: Is there a cost to convert whatever Postgres is into Arrow? Yeah. I mean, certainly yes. So but doesn't, doesn't that one fifty like that show the cost of converting like Postgres to the whatever format the paper? No, th th this is the cost of converting Arrow into the uh, a Postgres compatible protocol that sends things in a vectorized format. This is like I don't do any copying; I just literally shove the bytes out. And the paper talks about it like to do like to do something like this to rewrite your wire protocol. It'd be very unlikely that the you're storing, storing that data natively anyway. So you if you just have things just convert things to arrow or have things already be arrow internally, then that's a better way to do this. And that's why you see some systems like the intermediate results going from one operator to the next, the query plan, or how they exchange data between the different workers. If everything's an arrow, then like you have the infrastructure to, to shove the data out like that. Okay, so the in these experiments are sh showed here. The we talked about how like okay the the, the network protocol like do you compress things is is it how are you encoding the serialization format how much de metadata you're sending around like that was what we focus on but that isn't always going to be the, the the major slowdown of sending things over the network right and as I said many times the OS is going to be a problem for us. It's always going to try to ruin our lives, make things harder for us, break up our marriages, and whatever, right? And in particular, TCP IP stack is just going to be super slow, uh, and ideally, we want to try to avoid it. So why is it slow? Well, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's the networking implementation is, is based on this model of interrupts. So like, you know, they're, they're requiring, they're, they're assuming these interrupts are going to come along, and that's how it's going to trigger things like, hey, bytes are ready to go in and out, and that's, you know, and you're going to do a context switch. Like all that becomes super expensive. Then you get data coming on the NIC. The OS wants to copy that in its own internal kernel buffers. And then before it hands you that memory, it's going to copy into your user space buffers. Right? Wait, what's that face? What's that? What's wrong? Wait, sorry. This is what we're trying to do. Yeah, this sucks. Yeah. This is terrible. Um, furthermore, all right, so the kernel's got a bunch of threads coming down. And they're handling the interrupts. They're handling things coming over the, the NICs and, and hardware and so forth. Well, they, those have to be scheduled. Uh, they have to maintain their own latches for their own internal data structures. All that is going to be problematic, right? 
So we want to figure out a way that we can avoid the OS as much as possible. Again, we need, it to, we need the OS to survive. We need it to, to give us some memory uh, and obviously schedule us. But after that, we want to avoid it as, as much as possible. Um, and that's going to allow us our data sets to run, to run faster. And so what I'll talk about next is going to be focusing primarily on for, for networking stuff, but this also applies for disk. Um, you, want to avoid, you want to avoid the OS for disk as much as possible, too. All right, so the first approach to me, uh, what I call kernel bypass. And the idea here is that we want to be able to get data directly from the hardware, in this case, the NIC, the thing that the network interface. We want to get that into our database system running in user space, into our memory up there, without having to go through the OS, without doing any copying, ideally without having to talk to the OS TCP IP stack. Right? Um, and so there's, there's three different ways you can do this. There's the DBDK, uh, RDMA, and then IOU ring is, is, is going to be the, the newer one. Right? So the way to think about this is like OS is, Linux is a time sharing system. And that means it's going to rely on these slow, expensive interrupts to, again, tell it when one, there's something new showing up and take away, some, you know, take away executing some thread to go let now the kernel thread deal with whatever that, you know, that interrupt handler. Right? And then all these additional threads on the inside, they're going to maintain their own latches, and all those things are going to be problematic for us. Now, Linux has gotten a lot better in the last, I mean, the 10 years. Over the 10 years, it's gotten way better for handling with... Uh, uh, you know, large number of core counts. It's gotten way more scalable than it, than it used to be. But, you know, when, whenever there's contention, no matter how great your code is, everything's always going to fall over. So we want to avoid as much as possible. All right, so let's go through these one by one. So the DBDK, uh, the Data Plane Development Kit, uh, this is from something from Intel. Um, so it's a set of libraries that allow your user space program to interact with the NIC directly. Um, there's, a, uh, there's an equivalent for in the storage world called the SPDK, the Storage Plane Data Kit. Um, also from Intel. And the idea here is that you treat whatever the, the hardware device you're tr trying to interact with as a raw device, meaning you're responsible for like, reading the low-level bits in, 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 in the memory space of that device and interacting with it. And this goes against the Unix philosophy where everything's a file. Right? No matter whether it's a file on disk or it's a hardware device, you interact with these things as files, right? your F reads and, and, and so forth. But this, is, this, this breaks this, this model entirely. Um, so now, because now the OS is, is we're moving the OS from, uh, from the low-level layers, like 3 and 4, that means that in our database system, we're responsible for doing a bunch of stuff that the OS would do for us. And ideally, we, we could do this better, but not always. So the most obvious thing, if we're doing this, using DBDK to do networking stuff, well, now at, since, since there isn't the TCP, the OS isn't running the TCP IP stack for you on the device, we have to do that in our database system. So you either write it by hand, or you can use an open source library like fstack that basically re-implements in user space TCP IP, like sending the sequence numbers, sending back acts, like all that we have to do ourselves. The OS isn't, isn't going to do this, and the hardware doesn't do it. But the advantage is that we don't have any data copying, because we're now we're getting literally raw buffers of, of packets. We have to manage what, what those are uh, off the device. Um, we're not calling a read. Excuse me, there's, there's no syscalls. Everything is done, again, reading directly into memory. So this sounds amazing, right? Well, it's not that common, right? As far as we know, there's only two systems that actually implement or use DBDK. The first is Scalia DBs, and they have this framework called uh, CSTAR that they're built on top of. Scalia DB is a uh, re-implementation of, of Apache Cassandra and C++ uh, with like coroutines and, and DBDK and some other optimizations, um, where Cassandra is entirely in, in Java. And then Yellow Brick we'll cover later on. They also use this as well. But we had the, the Scalia DB guys gave a talk with us a few years ago <coughs> during the pandemic. And they mentioned how in the C star, they yes, you use coroutines, yes, you use DBDK, but DBDK for them has been a total nightmare to deal with. And I think it's turned off by default at this point. I saw the Yellow Brick CTO a few weeks ago at CIDR, and he, as far as I know, they're still using DBDK for their implementation. Um, again, we're doing this, they're doing this though in, in the back end not between the client and the, and the server. Right? Why is it so hard? Well, again, because you have to implement a bunch of stuff that OS normally do for you. You have to implement it yourself. And we tried this in our system. We had one of my best master students try to use fstack to speed up something, another project we were doing to make a Postgres proxy run faster, and we, just could, we couldn't make it work. Um, the engineering cost is just way too high. So to, to, it's a bit crude, but this is one of my favorite tweets of all time. 
Uh, so this guy's talking about the SBDK, which again, that's for the storage plane data kit, but the DBDK certainly applies here, right? So all this kernel bypass stuff is fantastic. You think you're gonna get a big win, but it's like peeing your pants because you're cold, and then you regret it uh, pretty quickly. This is the guy who wrote IRD rings. Is it? Yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. All right, so the next approach is you do RDMA, and then this is where you have a, uh, it's like NVMe, there's, there's, a, uh, there's an API that the hardware provides, allows you to do write directly into the hardware device and get uh, to access things on, on a remote machine as if it, it was local. Um, so for this one's a bit more tricky because now if you're reading writing to memory addresses on a remote machine, you gotta be sure that you know, what, what you're actually reading is what you expect to read. So there is more handshaking you have to do to set this up. Um, so this is typically, again, something you maybe don't want to use on, on the client and the server. You want to do this on the back end. But if you can pull this off, then you get a, you get a huge win. So it used to be you could only do this on a Finiban, which was, was sold by uh, Mellanox. I think NVIDIA bought Mellanox recently or some, at some point. NVIDIA uses this though. Yeah, NVIDIA uses this. Yeah, they have MV, NVLink as well. But like, um, and then but Rocky is, is basically uh, RDMA over converged Ethernet or something. Th th this is more common now. Um, so RDMA is not used that often. Like the only system I know that does this, like they'll sell it to you is Oracle for Exadata. Again, but that's like you buy the whole rack. You buy the, the rack of compute and the rack of storage and they're using RDMA to communicate between the, the compute and the storage. Um, you, can get, uh, you can get RDMA on, on Amazon, but like you, you, can, you would only be able to do the communicate between your own machines that have that. And it's a lot more work to, to, get, to get that set up. Yes? So how this works basically is that the client knows exactly what address the data is stored on the server. Yes. So it just says, give me 0x1024. And yeah. I'll get that. So his statement is, and he's correct. Like, the way this works is that the, the client, or it doesn't have to be, again, the, the, the application. It could just be the thing it's going to talk to some other machine. has to know what, what memory address it wants to read, assuming it has permissions. And then the request is, give me the contents of that memory. So the hardware knows how to go up to memory, get whatever you want and pull it back down, and it doesn't notify the CPU that, that it's done that. Yes? Is there a security problem with this? The question is, is there a security problem for this? Sure, but like, you know, you, you run this in your VPC, you're not letting, you're not letting, you don't expose this over, over the, the public internet. Again, if you're buying Exadata, these things are like millions of dollars. You're running this on-prem, it's a locked cage. You know, it, the traffic is just between these two things. All right, so the last one is uh, IOU ring, uh, which I think some of you guys are familiar with. But this was an extension to uh, in Linux to sort of clean up their asynchronous AIO uh, API um, that allows you to, to, to do asynchronous requests to a uh, hardware device, either storage or networking. It was originally storage, and then they, then they added networking uh, two years ago. Um, and basically, the idea is that you have these circle buff circular buffers where you submit a request and say, I want this data from this, this storage device or this, this hardware device. Uh, then you get like a, a callback you provide it to say, okay, when it's available in my buffer, let me know. So you can make a bunch of these requests. Uh, I don't think it, it's, it's not entirely bypassing the kernel. It's just less, it's not, you're not paying the overhead of making the syscall to, to, and block waiting for, for, the, for the data, right? So you make the request to do whatever it is, the read or write and whatever the, the on the memory that you provide the, the OS, the OS does it for you in a kernel thread, and then when, once it completes the, the, the task you asked it to do, it puts the result in a queue and then gives you, gives you a callback, right? So again, this is a low latency way to avoid the overhead of a, of a, of a full syscall to talk to a hardware device, but you're still relying on the OS to do the low level marshaling of data in and off the device, yes? Correct me if I'm wrong, but I thought there was no callback. I thought you just checked the completion case. The library. There's four different ways to do it. So you can either be pulling, like keep okay. checking, uh, or you can also block if you want to. So you can, yeah, you can also have a callback. There's a bunch of these libraries, and you guys look them up for Rust. There's one in, uh, in Linux or, or in C++. They, they provide different program APIs. I don't know which one's the most common. Okay. That was the one that I knew. So as far as I know, very few systems uh, do this, although you guys are Well, I need, I need, there's two more. Yeah. So the first one is, is, is uh, QuestDB. Uh, so they talk about in, was it 2022, 
how they added IU, IU U-Ring. Um, and then for this one, it, QuestDB is a Java, the, the top part of it is Java, and they use JNI to call down C++ code. Um, Tiger Beetle is another one, um, and they're using IO ring. But this is, this is for transactional stuff. This is actually written in Zig, um, not Rust. And so I think there's some library in Zig that made this easier for them to do. Um, but huh? It's in their standard library. Yeah. And I, we talked to somebody recently, or yesterday, who was like, uh, they implemented fast lanes in Zig because the SIMD stuff was way better than, uh, than Rust. The interesting one, though, is ClickHouse. So they came out with a blog article in 2021 about, hey, they're, they're adding IU ring uh, and asynchronous IO to ClickHouse. I think there is a, we had a guy give a talk for, for, from the Postgres team about adding IU ring to Postgres, but like, that's going to be, I think, years away because they're rewriting the whole storage layer in, in Postgres. And I think they're finally going to get rid of the OS page cache, which is nice. But anyway, so there's this blog article that talks about, like, hey, look, here's what IOU ring can do for us. Uh, it's going to be a big win. He submitted the pull request. But then when you go look at the pull request, lo and behold, you come down here, and here's one of the original developers of, I, of uh, ClickHouse and, and current CTO. He basically says, like, yeah, they, they, he tried adding it, but it was marginal improvement, and uh, it became an engineering nightmare. Right? He says, it became so complicated that even an experienced C++ engineer, the author of the code, could not figure out why there are rare hangs of queries right? that they found through their testing. So that was, so the blog article was 2021. This post is 2022. But then in the release of, post, of, 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 uh, of ClickHouse in February 2023, here's the same dude giving a live stream talking about how they've now added IU ring. So they did mer end up merging this code. And they're touting how it's the, the magic pill to make IO less slow right? In, in his webinar. But then you go look at the pull request again. And this is just a few weeks ago, uh, or a few months ago. He's posting here, I didn't observe IO U ring to be much slower, but also I have no big expectations because I wasn't able to find cases when it's faster. Because he's responding to somebody up above that talks about how like IO U ring, when you enable that, makes his queries run slower. So uh, I think, huh? It's all debatable. Yes, go ahead. All of these systems, none of them are like asynchronous. Like they, they're all like built like to be synchronous, like blocking. Uh, like, like, sorry, like, the rest of the framework is not asynchronous. Like the, right? the query execution code itself is blocking. Is blocking yes. So, so like how, how would they ever get any performance better other than like just batching system calls? I, I, like batching That's and then, it. yeah, and, and oh, then like, you, I, I need to read these 10 blocks, go batch a bunch of stuff, yeah. go process the ones that are available, and then in the background, go, you know, when, when it's available, I, I can process it. I think that's, that's the only thing that they could benefit out of it. I, I think that's what they're doing. I don't, I don't know about QuestDB. Mm -hmm. QuestDB is like written by uh, HFT guys out of London, and those dudes all sorts of, like they know how to make Java work really fast. So I, I, just, I don't know how they implemented theirs. And Quadrant also did it. But oh, they did it? Yes. So, you, oh, you should, so you have a crappy MAP implementation, and then they're like, okay. It's basically like if, like if I chop my leg off and I, can't, I can barely walk, but I sew the leg back on, now I can walk. Yeah. Like it's, yeah, got it. Okay. All right, so I think, I, I don't want to comment. Too, I think the jury's still out. I think that it's, this is still pretty bleeding edge, uh, but it's interesting to see what you guys come up with. All right, so I want to quickly talk about two last things. Um, so these are all sort of user, uh, sort of kernel bypass methods, um, but there's an, another alternative is instead of trying to avoid talking to the kernel, what if we put things in the kernel that we would want, right? To avoid copying up into the user space. So let's take a time. Let me skip this. Um, so this, this is a technique called user bypass. Um, it's not a new idea. Like people have done kernel modules and extendable kern, uh, OS kernels for 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 decades. Um, what makes it different now is what we'll see in the next slide. But the idea here is that instead of trying to again bypass this part here and pull a bunch of this logic up into the database system, what if we can put database system logic down in the, in, the, in the kernel and so that when data comes in, we can process it or do whatever we want on it as quickly as possible without having to come into user space and, and then, if necessary, go back down to the harbor to send things back immediately. So this makes sense when the the, the data you're, that, that's, that's coming in with the, the network or whatever it is doesn't need to be retained for a long time. Uh, like if, if, if it's a, if it's like a, 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 say an acknowledgement message and I need to keep track of that I got it and that I, that I don't need to retain it, 
then this, this, this technique could potentially would work, right? So because you avoid all the overhead of copying buffers, of scheduling additional threads, and making system calls, because everything now is just running inside the kernel, right? Which is always going to be faster. So as I said, kernel modules are one way to do this. But like, if you've ever written a kernel module before, you can ask ChatGPT. GPT. Uh, it's a pain in the ass. It's super cumbersome. If you crash, what do you get? Kernel panic. You take everything down. And then in some scenarios, you can't even load kernel modules for security reasons. Like the, the horror won't let you, you know, enload an unsigned, um, you know, unsigned kernel module. Right? So the thing that has changed where they make this actually viable now is something called EPPF. Out of curiosity, who here has heard of EPPF before? Well, other than people that hang out with my student Matt, right? <laughs> so BPF is, is uh, we'll talk about BPF, then we'll talk about what EPPF is. BPF stands for the Berkeley Packet Filters. So this was like in the early 90s, they had, uh, it was made for BSD, and they eventually made it Linux. But it was, um, it was a way to specify like packet forwarding rules uh, and, and filtering rules like through a DSL that you then load into uh, to the kernel, right? And so the EPPF, not really about packet filter anymore, but it's basically a way to take uh, write safe code uh, that then gets verified and then load that dynamically as, a, as if it was a kernel module on the fly. And the reason why I'm saying they sort of safe is that they, they give you a limited API, which you're allowed to actually do in these kernel module programs that you're running, right? So you can't call malloc. You can't, you know, can't sit in an infinite loop forever, right? Because they're ideally, they're trying to avoid you from, from you know, taking down the kernel and breaking everything. So you write your code, your BPF program in C code. You run it through their compiler that generates bytecode that then runs through a verifier and literally does basically branch expansion and figures out all the different possible paths you could go down in your code and counts the number of instructions that you would execute and then throws an error and, and, and throws back uh, and rejects it if you, if you have too many, uh, too many instructions. Right, so this is this is a wild thing because again, this basically allows you to extend Linux without having to recompile Linux. So so this is heavily used at like Netflix for like observability to be able to you know get metrics about what processes are running and, and get get this data out. But as as the you know since Matt's been working on it here, the API is expanded. So there's a lot more things you can start doing now. You can basically run an entire database system down in your in your kernel. So whether or not that's a good idea or not. That's what his research is going to figure out. But there are the idea is that can we start thinking about what part of the database system that we're spending a lot of time on, moving data back and forth between the OS or the hardware and, and, the, and, the, and the database system, what can we start pushing down? So I'm going to show one graph from his paper uh, where he was re-implementing um, uh, uh, Postgres wire protocol, protocol proxy. So I think a proxy would sit in front of Postgres. It, it, the client connects to it. And the proxy maintains uh, available connections to the database system and just forwards your packets along that. So in this scenario here, packet shows up to send a query request. Um, and then the proxy just looks at it and says, oh, it needs to go to the server, and this sends it. That's all it's really doing. It's not, you know, it's not doing any computation on it. So we're comparing its PG Bouncer, which is the most common, um, most common uh, proxy implementation used for Postgres. Odyssey is at a VNDEX. Uh, and this is like doing, it runs in user space, but they're using like, Handwritten coroutines written in an assembly, where the assembly overwrites the stacks of other threads to put inject like what the next thread to run. It's, it's, it's very impressive, but it's very complicated. And, and then our, ours is based on it's, an, it's a fork of PG Bouncer, where all of the authentication stuff happens up in, in the user space, like you know SSL setup and things like that. All that or, or user password stuff all happens up there. But then when packets show up just to forward them, all that's done down done down EPPF. And so the main takeaway here is if you run on, on a really small machine, uh, you're getting pretty significant performance improvement because you're not paying the penalty of copying things uh, back and forth between the kernel. So I'm not saying BBF can be solved for all the things that we talked about today, but I think this is, this is, this is going to be a better solution than something like DBDK and potentially IOU ring for some things, but not everything. All right. We've got one minute left, so let me just bang through this real quickly. So, Assume we do all the optimizations to get things out of the server back to the client. Client's got to do something with it and put it into the form that, that the application needs. And as I said, if it's JDBC, ODBC, like that's copying things as, as a row oriented format, that's, you know, it, the overhead's not going to be that significant. But if it's the scenario where it's a data scientist trying to get things out of the data system and put it into pandas, then that's going to be slow. So this here, this, from, this is an experiment they did where 
they took pandas, ran a, a SQL query through pandas uh, SQL API, that went to Postgres MySQL, got data back, and then converted it into a, a data frame. Data frame is like the, the, the table abstraction in, in pandas and, and, and a bunch of other Python systems. So in this case here, the, the chart showing that the query part is, 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 is not that, not that it's not a, it doesn't take a long time relative to all the cost of actually copying the data off the bits we got uh, from the server and converting it into to the data frame. Again, ADBC with Arrow solves this problem because if, you're, if your Python code can interact with, natively operate on Arrow data, then you don't have to do this conversion. But if your system doesn't support the ADBC, like MySQL and Postgres, then you have to pay this penalty. So the gist of what they're doing is that they have this thing called Connector X. Um, it is using Polars and a, a couple other systems, I think, as well, like Modin. Um, and basically, your SQL query shows up that you write in, in Python. They, you then also provide some information about how to split that query up into to subqueries or, or uh, partition queries, like range partitioning. And then you send out multiple queries at the same time from different threads that are going to get a portion of the data that you would want to put into your, your Python program. And then each thread then going to populate the data frame uh, at different, different chunks. So instead of taking one SQL query, get back a giant result, and then one thread po populates the, the table, they take one SQL query, rewrite it by adding like, additional expressions in the where clause, then send that out in parallel, get back multiple results, and then the threads put it together. I just want to bring this up because it's an alternative if you don't have ADBC that this, this is another approach to do this. All right, we're well over time, so I apologize. All right, so networking protocol matters a lot. Uh, kernel bypass can make a big difference, but it's a pain in the ass to use. I think EPBF is going to be the, the, something that's going to get it more uptick in the next, the next 10 years or so, okay, as EPBF can, gets more expressive. Okay, so next class uh, will be on query optimization, and we'll have three lectures on that, and that'll be, again, the, the core material we need to understand before we start looking at other real-world implementations. And I know I haven't posted the, um, the updated reading list because I don't know what paper to read for the, for the first class because, like, there really isn't a good one. Um, but we'll, we'll, we'll figure something out. Uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll update the reading list tonight, okay? Any questions? Get a grip, take a sip, and you'll be picking up models. Ain't it no puzzle, I'll guzzle cause I'm more man. I'm down in the 40 and my shorty's got sore cans. Stacks and six packs on the table. And I'm able to see St. Isles on the label. No shorts with the cloth, you know I got them. I take off the cap, but first I tap on the bottom. Throw about three in the freezer so I can kill it. Careful with the bottle, baby, you just don't spill it. Cause St. Isles is said, the pain I red. You drink it down with the guys, it'll my head. Take back the pack of duds. You go get you some St. Isles and drink it to the studs. Billy D is the chili cheese, so down with the weak guys. Be a man and get a can of snake eyes.